Hi, Grade Nines, and welcome to 9.2, Potential Problems with Data Collection. We talked a bit at the end of 9.1 about how statistics can be manipulated by people to serve their own agendas. And in a similar vein, the way that we collect data is also subject to bias. And uh, you have to be very careful when you're conducting research that you word your questions and conduct your surveys and data collection in a way that it doesn't artificially skew the data to a certain point of view. And that can be very difficult because we're dealing with human beings. And uh, no matter what anyone will tell you, all human beings have bias based upon their moral code, based upon their upbringing, based upon the environment uh, in which they uh, live and grew up in. So it's, uh, it's very difficult to get what we would consider purely <clears throat> um, quantitative data, whereas, uh, it, you know, it's just numbers, it's just statistics, and it's completely without any sort of bias. Usually, there is some sort of human aspect of it, and that will skew the data somewhat. So the goal is to minimize that amount of skew so that you can look at the data and say, um, it's very objective, meaning it's, it's not something that I'm viewing with an, a certain opinion or, or uh, stance against or for. So again, this is this can be very, very difficult. It's something that researchers struggle with all the time. And we're going to go through some of the examples of um, ways that you can make data collection a little bit more objective and try to minimize the subjectivity of it. But first we have to look at what are the potential problems that we could come across. And uh, the first one that we're going to touch on is, is bias. A bias is when, uh, you know, the question sort of influences responses in favor of or against a certain topic. An example of this, and I'm just going to, I'm going to type in here because I don't think I've got the room to write. Let's make my pen a little bit smaller here. Um, a question that might influence your response of is, um, why do you think that Brad Pitt is the most handsome man in the world. Okay. Hopefully you can see why that would be sort of what we consider a biased question. It says, doesn't really ask who you think is the most handsome person in the world. Man, woman, doesn't really matter. In this case, I just picked Brad Pitt, who happens to be a man. The, that's not the point of the question. The point of the question is, is um, I'm leading you down a path and demonstrating a bias. So it could be reasonably assumed that because I asked the question in this way, I'm biased, which means I'm sort of leaning toward the idea that Brad Pitt is the most handsome person in the world. And because I framed the question that way, I'm sort of pushing my agenda on you. Whereas if I asked a different question, something to the effect of who do you think is the most attractive person in the world, I'm giving you more freedom to answer. And uh, there's going to be less of a skew toward what I think. And that really leads very closely into the next one, which is use of language. The use of language in a question leads people to a particular answer. And uh, it's very, very closely related to bias. And, and we'll use an example that sort of, uh, you know, illustrates that a little bit more here. Sorry, I'm just looking for proper size. And that might be, um, don't you think that Brad Pitt is the most handsome. Maybe I should say person in the world. Once again, it's a very almost the same question, but in this particular instance, by asking, "Hey, don't you think that Brad Pitt is the most attractive handsome person in the world?" Again, I'm sort of pushing my bias upon you by the way I use my language, and what I'm trying to get you to say is yes. So don't you agree with me? Yes, don't you agree with me? So the way that you phrase the questions that you're asking can also skew and demonstrate bias and push people toward a certain answer, if not um, a certain point of view, a, a certain response that they're going to give you. Next one is timing. When data collect is collected leads to particular results. Um, one of the examples that the, that the textbook gives is, let's just say we're, we're talking about winter tire use and, and whether or not you think it's important to... Um, to put winter tires on your car, if you ask people, is it important to have winter tires on your car? You know, if you ask it, 
in winter, you might get different results than if you asked in summer. So the timing of when you ask a question might very well impact the results that you get and the responses that you get from the people you asked. So keep that in mind as well. Oh dear, what did I do there? Privacy, if the topic of data collection is personal, a person may not want to participate or may give intentionally an untrue answer, which obviously will, will give a negative skew to your data. It won't be as accurate as it could have been. So a way you can get around this is anonymous surveys may help, obviously giving people a very upfront choice about collecting data um, and what you're asking and what you're hoping to receive as far as their opinions on things. Uh, there's never any reason to hide anything. You want to be as open and as upfront as you can be and respect everybody's right to either uh, not, you know, to not participate in the study if they think it's something that intrudes upon their privacy. Um, for instance, uh, you know, asking someone, you know, um, how much money you make, money they make, may be viewed as a, a very personal and um, private a, a affair. Someone may not want to tell you how much money they make. They may say, well, that's none of your business. So, you know, things like that. Another, you know, an example the textbook gave is, is if you wanted people to participate in a study and part of the study is having them step on a scale in a public place. There's a lot of people that might think that that's a real intrusion uh, into their uh, privacy and, uh, or, and or maybe embarrassed or anxious about doing something like that. So it's, it's things that need to be respected. Cultural sensitivity, you have to be aware of other cultures. You are typically not conducting data analysis in a homogenous environment. What that means is where everybody's kind of looks the same, everybody has sort of the same background, the same upbringing. Typically you're collecting data, especially when you're doing it with people from a wide cross section of different beliefs and different, uh, you know, different races and different viewpoints and different upbringings. So you've got to be very culturally sensitive. You've got to be sensitive to questions that might not apply to people or uh, might even be offensive to people. Um, a textbook question or a textbook example of this is, you know, asking someone, um, how do you, how do you cook ham? Okay. Barbecue, question mark, oven. Now that could be cons uh, considered a culturally insensitive question to ask because of uh, many cultures, do not eat pork. And, uh, you know, this could be sort of a, a geographically based or uh, you have, may, may have something to do with religion. It may have something to do just with dietary habits. Um, you know, vegetarians wouldn't eat pork. So that's something that you've got to be aware of. That, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't ask somebody um, how they cook pork, but you probably want to preface it with a, a, a question beforehand that says, um, do you eat pork? And if the answer is no, there's really no point in asking them if they cook it, you know, how they cook ham or how they cook pork. Um, so it's not necessarily, I think, culturally insensitive to ask uh, if you eat uh, ham or pork, because, I mean, if they think it's too private an answer, or they don't want to talk about it, they will have told you so, or you will have explained at the front of the survey that we're going to be asking about foods and eating habits, and they may say, um, well, yeah, that's fine, but I, I, you know, I don't eat pork, or they may say I'm not comfortable talking about that, so you never get to these questions. So it's really important to be open and honest with the people you're collecting data from, and ask questions in the right way. So when you say, how do you cook ham, if that's your first question, do you barbecue it, do you, do you cook it in the oven, you're making the assumption that they, that they eat pork, and you're sort of making, um, you're not, likely you're not intentionally doing it, but you're sort of making a, a you're revealing a bias that you think that cooking pork is a normal thing, quote, normal thing, um, when it certainly doesn't apply to all cultures. So just another example of things you've got you've to be aware of. Um, ethics is another very important concept when dealing with data collection. It has to be used only for the purpose that you, that you, ex, you know, express to the people that you're asking questions of or collecting data. You've got to be clear with them and what you're going to use this data for. You can't just collect data from people without telling them what you're using it for and then go and sell it to somebody else. So things like that or, or you know, report things to 
companies or other agencies that people may or may not be comfortable with, right? You can't go around asking people how much tax they paid last year and then take all that data and their names and their information and then give it to, you know, the Canada Revenue Agency so that the Canada Revenue Agency can can check to see if they actually paid that much, much tax. So that'd be an example where it would be an, ina- an, ineth- an unethical thing to do with the data you collected. So you've got to be careful that you ha- you express to people how you're using this data as well as, you know, you know why you're collecting it and what you're collecting. Okay? So uh, the, the textbook example here that they give is, suppose you tell your classmates that you know their favorite snack, that you want to know what their favorite snack is to help plan a birthday party. If you then give that information, say, to a local restaurant so that they start stocking more of those things so they can sell more things to, your, to the, the students, that would be unethical because you told the students that you were collecting that information just for your birthday party, not to give it to somebody else so that they can sell stuff to them. So collecting, I think just in, in, in general, one of the examples would be collecting personal uh, information on eating habits, maybe. And then giving it to a restaurant without asking the participants first. Or telling them up front when you're collecting the data that this is what I'm doing. I'm going to collect this data and we're trying to find out what people are eating and what their favorite foods are and it's going to this restaurant. Well, if you tell them that up front and they still tell you, I like hamburgers or I like, you know, I like steak or or whatever, I like salads, whatever that is. If you tell them that I'm collecting information for McDonald's because we want to find out what you like to eat so we can make our our menu better, better, that's okay because you've been very upfront about how you're going to use the data. Now, this is more on the uh, data collection front as far as planning what data you're going to take in. You have to be very you know, aware of how much it costs to, to ca- collect data. Um, certain things like, uh, you know, a random, seemingly, a, 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 I guess it wouldn't be considered a, a particularly random sample, but if you were in a mall and you were just stopping people who walked by and giving them a little questionnaire and writing down the responses or typing down the responses in your um, in a computer or a notebook, it's a relatively low cost survey. All it is is, is you know, the, the cost of a person's salary or wage to be out there to do it and a notebook and a pen, very low cost. However, if you want to conduct a survey where say you have to mail out um, a survey that people fill in and then send back to you, it could be very expensive. It costs a lot of money to print. It costs a lot of money for stamps to send out the letters. Plus you'd have to include a, a stamp for them to return um, the letter back to you with their survey data. So things like that will cost a lot more money. And obviously, the more people that you try to contact, the more money it's going to cost you. That's why a lot of surveys are done by a phone or by the internet, because it's just not as expensive to contact people and collect the data prior to processing it. So um, in general, you just want to make sure that the cost, you understand how much it's going to cost to reach the people with the medium that you choose. So for an example here, I'll I'll say mailing out um, questionnaires or surveys, I'll just call them. Mailing out surveys is expensive. Um, Using a Google form to collect data is much less expensive. And I'm not saying that to try to push you toward using you know, a Google form or something else that's electronic. It's just a statement of fact. It's going to be a lot cheaper than buying, than printing off surveys and sending them and and, um, paying postage and things like that. Also, you got to consider the time needed to collect data. A survey that uh, you complete, that takes people an hour to complete is too long. Like very, very few people are going to complete a survey that takes them an hour. Very, very few people are going to complete a survey that takes two minutes. So you've got to be very cognizant. You've got to be very aware of how valuable people perceive their time to be. So if you've got a 30 second survey and you tell them up front, this is literally going to take 30 seconds. I'm going to ask you five questions. You're more likely to get somebody to say, yeah, okay, I can give you 30 seconds. than if you say up front, this survey is going to take about 15 minutes and I'm going to ask you a hundred questions. Unless it's a really, really important topic that they feel very strongly about. Most people, if you say, I need 15 minutes of your time, we're going to say, I don't have that kind of time. And they're, and they're just not going to fill in the survey or they're not going to stop and talk to you when you're asking the questions or they're not going to or they're going to hang up the phone on you. So you have to be very aware 
of how valuable people's time is. And again, depends on what you're asking. If it's something that the person feels is very, very important, they're going to give you more time. If it's a, let's say it's something, a, a political survey, and it's about um, how do you feel about what the government's doing about the environment? If you talk to somebody who is very, very concerned and involved in um, environmental you know, studies and, and the approaches that our, that our governments are taking toward reducing greenhouse gases and things like that, they might give you 15 minutes of their time. Whereas if you say, I'm going to go through a thousand candy bars and I want you to tell me if you like them or, or if you don't like them or if you've never eaten them before, and it's going to take about 15 minutes, the vast majority of people are going to say, well, that doesn't sound that important to me and I don't really care and I'm not giving you 15 minutes. Whereas you might have gotten them to ask, you know, answer five questions. You know, here's five candy bars. Have you eaten them? Uh, yes, no, did you like it or did you not like it? You'd be more likely to get somebody to answer a sur uh, shorter survey than that. So uh, just in general, um, people value their time. Um, shorter surveys with few questions typically get better results. Longer surveys can be effective, but the participants must be, I'm going to say invested heavily in the topic. And this comes, this comes with some, uh, some potential dangers as well with regard to ethics. Uh, you know, I, I, sometimes people pay participants to be in a survey. And collect data and there's some questions as to whether or not that makes it a an ethical study if you're paying someone to give you their opinion um, can you still trust that it is a, an unbiased opinion or may might it sway them in a different direction or toward a different point of view a certain point of view based on what the survey is about and how you're paying them and how much you're paying them so it's going to be, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you can't answer that question unless you give some, uh, some pretty careful thought to what the topic is and what they're collecting the data for and why they're collecting the data. But it's just something to keep in mind that um, if you're paying somebody for their responses, you have to ask yourself that question. Am I collecting good data? Am I getting good ethical data? All right, let's go through some examples of these and, uh, and we'll... We'll analyze a couple situations and see what we think. So for each survey here, we're going to explain why a problem might occur and okay, what effect it might have, and then let's see if we can sort of fix the problem. The survey is conducted to find out if citizens think local government should provide more money for youth activities. The question they asked on the survey was, would you support an increased tax in taxes to create more skate parks? Now that is a tough question. That it that could be conceded, uh, sorry, that could be um, perceived as being a leading question, okay, where you where language is used in a biased way. So it's kind of you know the top two. We're we're giving some bias here, and we're using language that is leading the participants to a certain point of view. When they say and they lead with, "Would you support an increase in taxes?" Well, typically that is viewed by people as being a negative thing. People don't want to pay more taxes. Okay, so by leading with pay more taxes, you are using language that suggests a negative coming from providing more skate parks. So the perceived bias on this would be that the, that the person asking the question doesn't want more skate parks because they're leading with, hey, you're going to have to pay more taxes. And now that we've, you know, sort of discussed taxes, would you like to use that tax money to create more skate parks? So they're bringing up something that's perceived negatively in general by people uh, instead of asking it in a different way that might be a little bit less biased and give the person the opportunity to respond about skate parks as opposed to how we're going to pay for them. Okay? Now, it's not to say that the more taxes thing is not irrelevant. It's just the way that it's used in the question that kind of creates a bias and skews people toward the negative on that one. Okay, so by by pay, leading with pay more taxes, you're using language that suggests a negative coming from providing more skate parks. And I should just include in there because people generally 
do not want to pay more taxes. Nah. Perhaps a better way of asking that, perhaps ask a question without the taxes and maybe bring the taxes in in a different part of the survey or something like that. So, you know, perhaps ask, do you think, um, you know, do you think that, uh, let's see, Excuse me. Do you think the uh, that the local government should provide more funding for student deck or for, for you know skate parks for youth? And that gives you uh, you know that gives you a slightly less biased question to ask, and it's more focused on what I assume the uh, the topic is supposed to be about, and that is skate parks. And uh, you know people know that if governments are paying. Uh, or providing funding for something that it does lead to an increase in taxes. And if you really wanted to focus on that tax part, you could ask that at a different part in the survey and maybe maybe ask it in a different way, such as in order to pay for the skate, if they answered yes, that they think there should be more skate parks, uh, maybe ask a follow-up question that says, uh, in order to pay for these skate parks, what would you, you know, which approach would you take? Would you take a fundraising approach in the community? Would you, um, would you prefer that your, you know, it, it gets worked into your taxes? So that's a different way to get sort of less biased results um, while still finding out what people actually think about skate, about, you know, the idea of skate parks for young people. Okay, a survey is conducted to find out the level of school spirit. Students are polled about their level of school spirit after the soccer team wins the championship. Well, this is pretty clearly a case of timing. Um, school spirit is bound to be high right after a championship, uh, you know, winning a championship game. So, if you want less biased results, you know, which are going to be more accurate in the general scheme of things, you're not always a championship winning team, particularly not every day. So um, if you want less biased results, which are going to better represent the, I'm going to call it the general level of school spirit, you might want to wait a couple of months, maybe a couple of weeks or months before you ask that question. Perhaps after the, the, you know, the shine has come off the trophy a little bit, we're a couple more months down the road and a lot of people have forgotten the championship, but it's not, you know, it wasn't yesterday. Uh, maybe they're like more likely to give you a, a, a more balanced opinion about school spirit. So that one's, that's one's really about timing. Kublu and Ernique plan to open a shop in Saskatoon that would sell traditional Inuit crafts. To ensure Saskatoon is the best place for their business, they want to do a survey for residents to find out how popular Inuit crafts are in Saskatoon. So Kublu knows that they would get the most accurate result if each household in Saskatoon is surveyed. But Ernique points out that this is problematic. And why is that problematic? It cost and time. In particular, Saskatoon is a big city. I don't know what our actual population is now, but I got to think it's somewhere in the 250 to 275,000 range to include all the suburban areas. So Saskatoon's a big city. It would take, it would cost a lot of money to survey every person, whether you did it in person, you went door to door, or whether you mailed something out. Um, Saskatoon's a big city. It would cost a lot of money to survey everyone. Okay. And it would take a lot of time. To reach everyone. Believe me, there are lots of businesses who would like to know exactly what every citizen in Saskatoon uh, that would like to know what they think of their business or, or idea, but it's just not feasible. Okay, You can't go out and ask all 275,000 people in Saskatoon if they like your craft. It's going to cost too much, it's going to take too much time, and uh, you know, there's every, you know, you should have every reason to believe that you know, people aren't going to be home when you get there, so you're going to have to schedule follow-ups and whatnot. It's just not feasible. So from a from a cost and time perspective, you just couldn't do it. It would just cost too much and take too long. What might you do instead? You know, perhaps a random sample 
of people. So just randomly, you know, drawing names from a hat or addresses or something. So perhaps a random sample of people from a variety of neighborhoods in Saskatoon might give you the feedback you need to make a generalized decision about how people in Saskatoon feel about your craft. And remember, I, and what I said is a variety of neighborhoods in Saskatoon. Um, I just use it as sort of a geographical region, but you might say a variety of cultures in Saskatoon or a variety of, of uh, um, age groups or something like that, ways of splitting the population into different groups. Because if you ask a certain group, uh, maybe of a certain age group, or if, uh, you know, if the group uh, has a lot of uh, close connections with Inuit people, perhaps you'll get um, perhaps you'll get different data and different responses than you would have gotten if you asked somebody who doesn't have a whole lot of Inuit connection uh, in the city or uh, culturally speaking. So you, that's why you want to get data from a lot of different groups and a lot of different people because you can take that data and then you can sort of make a general um, a general decision about is Saskatoon a good place for us to open this business. And that doesn't mean that that other data, if you have targeted data from a certain community or a certain, you know, cultural segment, that doesn't mean that that's not important data. Because let's say you make the decision that you do want to start a business in Saskatoon because your data generally says that people think that, uh, that they like Inuit crafts and that this would be a good idea. After you answer the sort of big general question, then you might want to get a bit more specific. You might want to say, well, I still have to put my business somewhere in Saskatoon. So now where should I put it? Now you might want to look at that more specific segment and say, we've got a lot of people in this particular area of the city, in this particular neighborhood, who have very strong, um, positive opinions about Inuit crafts. So that might be a better place to put our business. So you can use that specified data, uh, but it usually, um, you should do that after you ask sort of the big picture questions and the more general questions. You start with the big picture ideas and then you work down and drill down to the very specifics, like where am I going to put my business and how much am I going to charge for, for each craft and things like that. All right, last example. Antonio wants to find out if there's a relationship between household income and how much people spend on Christmas presents. What are some potential problems with this? Um, people view money and income uh, as, as private, as very private. Um, people view money and income as very private. Uh, information. Uh, people tend to be reluctant to answer questions, you know, like how much money do you make? How much do you spend on whatever? I'll just call it. What, how much do you spend on X? Things like that. People tend to um, uh, to have privacy issues with asking questions like that. So this would be an example where you'd want to be very upfront with people when you're asking them to do the survey. You might say, I'm collecting information that um, is trying to relate the level of income of a person to how much they spend at Christmas. You want to be very upfront about that to let them know that those are the questions you're going to be asking. Um, another potential problem with this is, um, I'll say if you ask if they are comfortable with answering questions about income and spending. Okay, so if you ask if they're comfortable with answering questions about income and spending and spending and they agree, you still need to of potential bias and, and skewing of the results. And I'll give you an example of that. Um, this may not necessarily be true, but I think it's something to consider that if you ask somebody, um, um, can, you, can you answer some questions on my survey? I'm going to be asking questions about income level and how much you spend. The people that say yes to that question, okay, they may be more likely to answer yes to that question if they have a higher level of income 
And if they are, you know, sort of comfortable saying how much they spent because they are, you know, somewhat proud of it or they don't think it's a big deal and they just think it's normal. Whereas it's conceivable if you just lost your job or if you're, you know, if you're, you're in a bad financial uh, situation that you may feel some anxiety about answering questions about money. Um, you may feel, you know, that this is a, you know, this is a tough year. This is a bad year. Uh, and, you know, there may be some anxiety or embarrassment attached to that. I'm not saying there should be or that there has to be. I'm saying these are things you need to consider when you're collecting data. So, you know, ask yourself the question, is it possible that the people willing to answer these questions are generally in a higher income group than people who are not comfortable answering these questions. So it's definitely something you have to consider because the quality of your data, you know, is only as high as the people that you're that you're, you know, collecting it from. And if you're only collecting it from a very narrow group of people, but the question you're asking is about society in general, um, then you haven't gotten very good data. If your question is, people in general, how much do they make? What's the average? And how much do they spend? What's the average? And you only consider people that have a high income. You can't generalize the data that you get to say, okay, we collected all the data and we found that the average person in Saskatoon makes $90,000 a year and spends $10,000 on Christmas presents. That would be a bad um, conclusion to make because maybe the only people that answered your questions were from high income groups. So it's not good data and you didn't draw a good conclusion from it. So these are things that you need to consider. And there's a lot of it. There's a, a lot of, a lot of ways that data can be compromised. There's a lot of ways that your, um, even, you know, well-constructed surveys can give you data that you think is accurate, but there was a, there was a skewing of the data due to bias or the language you used or some sort of cultural significance and uh, researchers struggle with this all the time at all levels. So it is a, you know, a very big thing that we need to deal with in math mathematics and statistics. And it's just something I want you to be aware of when you are, um, you know, designing experiments or collecting data in whatever form you do it in, in your projects in high school, if, you know, maybe for a science class or a social studies class or a, an entrepreneurship class, it's just something you need to be aware of and how it can affect the mathematics behind data collection. As always, um, send us emails if you have any trouble with the questions, uh, the textbook questions that we've asked you to complete. And uh, we wish you the best of luck. We're getting near the end.